The best fried chicken in Texas. Rody's Country Fried Chicken. Texas born, Texas raised. A chicken joint with 35 years of service to our community. Thanks to our loyal customers and social media followers. Come try the best gizzards in Texas, the best tenders in Texas, and the best chicken in Texas. Call us at 830-773-9189. 830-773-9189. Don't forget, we have curbside service and delivery by DoorDash. Or find us on Facebook, Rodie's Chicken. R-O-D-E-E-S Chicken. Like us on Facebook. Like us on Facebook. The best fried chicken in Texas. Rodie's Country, Country Fried, fried Chicken. chicken. Metal Interview. Thank you for joining us on another episode, another installment of That Metal Interview with your host, James. That would be me. And uh, this time around, we have uh, the great talent of Jeff Plate uh, joining our show and chatting with us for a little bit and talking about his new band, his new uh, project, uh, Alta Rain, A L T A. Rain, R-E-I-G-N, Alta Rain, and he's going to explain to us why the name Alta Rain and where it came from. You'll be surprised, and a very, very cool reason from different places. Very cool. Anyways, you might recognize Mr. Jeff Plate from TSO, which is short for Trans-Siberian Orchestra, and, of course, with the legendary Sabotage. He's been with Sabotage since 1994 and has remained with sabotage and he's going to give us an exclusive update on the status of sabotage since there is there are a bunch of rumors going around that sabotage is, is making a comeback album and all kinds of different uh, rumors so he's going to clear that up for us and for all you fans that are waiting for this interview check it out man so anyways before we go on to the interview let's uh check out and let's listen to Thin Red Line by Alto Rain Project by Mr. Jeff Plate. We'll be right back with the interview with Jeff Plate. Enjoy Alto Rain Thin Red Line.
Now, wasn't that a badass jam right there? That's some badass stuff right there. Alto Rain, the new project, new band by Mr. Jeff Plate, and he's going to explain to us who was part of, who is a part of that project, and who recorded that, and this and that. And he's going to talk about that whole project, when it started, and uh, the future of Alto Rain, and his future with TSO, and of course, let's see if he reveals any sabotage news. Enjoy the interview with Jeff Plate, guys. Uh, before we get to TSO and Sabotage and uh, Metal Church, uh, let's talk about your new uh, project album, uh, Alto Rain, uh, Mother's Day, uh, 12 Great Tracks, uh, Rat Pack Records. Uh, talk to us about this record, Jeff. Well, this is something that's uh, it's kind of been on my bucket list for the past several years. I've, I've always wanted to do a project that I could call my own. And and this started, this, some of the riffs and the music that, that uh, laid the foundation for this record was stuff that I did years ago, back in Boston, back in around 1990, with, uh, with Zach Stevens, okay. who was a vocalist for Sabotage TSO, yes. uh, and, uh, and a guitarist named Matt Leff. And we had a band called Wicked Witch. We, we played a lot around New England. We, we actually did quite well for, uh, for the scene that we were in, but we never, we never really got a record deal and wrote some really cool songs. And while we were working on this project for you know, roughly three years, close to four years, um, you know, I, had a, I had a recording set up in our rehearsal studio and I, I basically recorded a lot of the stuff that we, that, we, that we were working on. And years later, I just kind of revisited some of these tapes, actually several years ago, and you know, it's like some of this music was, was really, really good. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't going to be used for anything unless I tried to do something with it. Um, unfortunately, Matt left. Like I mentioned, he was the guitarist at the time. He uh, he came down with cancer and oh. just became became unable to play. And uh, we actually lost Matt last year, right at the uh, right at the end of 2019. We, oh, we lost that. him. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, he was great. He was a good friend, phenomenal guitar player. But anyhow, I I asked Matt if he would mind if I if I used some of these riffs and some of these ideas that we had to create something and, and he gave me the green light and and this is where El Terrain started. So I got together with some local friends, uh, Tommy Cook on guitar and vocals and Kevin McCarthy on bass. And we basically just started taking some of these old riffs and first of all, they were on cassette tapes that were 30 years old. So some of them were, we had to figure out exactly what it was Matt was playing. <laughs> and, and some of it we had to just kind of interpret what Matt was playing. But but this is where we started building some songs. And along with the songs, which a lot of these ideas were not complete songs, we started writing parts to finish these pieces. And and I had a bunch of lyrical ideas, which, which helped uh, which helped form a lot of these a lot of these songs and in the, in the finished ideas. So. So it really, it started with, with myself and Tommy Cook and Kevin McCarthy. Uh, once we had probably three or four songs constructed, we realized that we had something that actually sounded really cool. And, and then I recruited uh, Colin Holloway on uh, vocals and guitar, uh, Zach Hamilton on uh, keyboards and vocals. The five of us began working on a lot of this material and really, really uh, I, I was in charge of doing the editing and the arranging and the producing of the whole project. So it took a little while to get the whole thing actually formed as far as the songs and the structures and, and everything. Uh, the last piece of the puzzle was, was Jane Mangini, who, who plays keyboards in TSO. I've, I've known Jane for close to 20 years, and we have we've talked many, many times about doing a project together. So I... Nice. I turned Jane. I turned Jane on to some of these ideas, and she absolutely loved it. And and what she brought to this music just it really took it from being just a guitar-driven hard rock metal project to something a little different. Yeah. Uh, it made it sound a little more progressive, a little more commercial in some places, um, and I dare say in some places that it even made the it even made it heavier. Uh, 
because it just made it bigger. And a lot of the a lot of the textures and the sounds that she brought really, really fit so well. But but all in all, this from from beginning to end, it basically took like two years from when I started the first sessions with Tommy Cook until we actually finished this and, and had the thing recorded. So a labor of love. I, I tell you, this is this is my first this is my first experience coming out from behind the drum kit and being the, you know, quote unquote leader of the project. You know, I, I, I did all the lyrics, wow. the arranging, the producing, uh, you know, all of the subject matter, everything was, was me. Um, the rest of the guys, especially Tommy and Kevin, did a great job helping me form some of these ideas and make sense of, you know, what I was thinking and and also too what was going to fit lyrically so it really was a really really cool group effort and uh yeah man we're all just very very proud of, of what we've accomplished i think the record is i think the record is very unique the response so far has been has been very positive and and we are right now actually starting to work on the second one but uh but we're still not promoting the first one so that's that's what that's what we're here for Awesome. Well, great job. And there's some badass jams in there, so uh, very, very cool. Um, Thank you, man. <clears throat> what's behind the name Alto Rain, and why that name? What, what, what's the story behind that? Okay, so so one of these one of these riffs from from years and years ago with 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 my friend Matt. There was a riff in the middle of one of these jams, and it was a riff that Matt played once. Okay. He never played the riff again. It was all like eight seconds. And it is, it is part of the riff in the chorus of Mother's Day. Okay. Well, anyhow, 20 years ago or whatever it was, I, I was just going through these tapes, and I always dubbed that riff and that idea of Mother's Day. So I've always had the idea for this song in my head for literally almost two decades. So anyhow, I had the song title. I knew I wanted to name the album Mother's Day. And I was talking to a friend, and she, uh, she said, Well, Jeff, is it your mother's name, Elta? And I was like, wow, as a matter of fact, it is. Oh, <laughs> and this light, oh, wow. bulb, this light bulb went off you know, above my head, and I was like, Alta. I love the, na the sound of that. Alta in Latin or, or Italian, whatever, it means higher, you know, like alto sax and an yeah. alto, alto vocalist. Uh -huh. So I loved the idea of, of that, because a lot of the songs, the lyrics are, they, they aim towards that, that kind of subject matter. So... So I began looking up the meanings of, of my name and my sister, Terry. Um, and depending on where you look, it would mean ruler or leader or peace or something like that. And I just started kind of juggling some names around. And rain was the, was the word that made sense for the theme. But also, it just sounded really cool. Yeah. Alpha Rain. Wow. And... And I presented it to, to the guys in my band, and like Jeff, that's the name. Go for it, and <laughs> and that was it. So, <laughs> wow. So it's it's pretty interesting. A lot of people, a lot of people that know me and know my mother, think the song Mother's Day is about my mother. Mother's Day is actually about Mother Earth. Okay. But 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 that title and that subject matter matter came around to her name, which then became part of the name of the band. So it's yeah, it's kind of an interesting little story, but the. Uh, but dude, I tell you, oh. you know, writing an album is hard, but coming up with a name is even harder. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's just incredible. There's so many bands that have, they seemingly have taken all the good ideas. Right. Yeah. And, and I stumbled onto this one. I was like, I love the sound of this. It, the, the name of the band fits the music. It fits the, the, the personality of what we're doing and the, and the people involved. And, and I think it, it just worked out really well. Wow, what an interesting story. Very cool. Wow. So what's your favorite track on uh, on Mother's Day, the album? Oh, God. I <laughs> got you there. <laughs> I, well, I tell you, you know, that they're all my babies, so I, I love them all. But, yeah. you know, it, it could change a little slightly any given day. I, I love Come Out and Play. Yeah. Um, I love Mother's Day. I love Rise. I mean, and then, you know, on the other end of that is is Always. Always, yeah. it's just such a beautiful ballad. I mean, it's, oh, yeah. it, it's just one of those things that kind of happened. And, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I'm really, really proud of all the songs. I think they're I think they're performed very well. 
uh, everybody involved in this recording really stepped up and did a fantastic job. Um, you know, lyrically and vocally, I'm just really happy with the way Tommy and Colin took what I was thinking and took my lyrics and really they sang them as if they were their own. Yeah. You know, they were they were they were 110 percent into this, and it really comes across on the record. But no, they they've all uh, they've all got a got a, a meaning that's close to me and. Uh, like I said, I'm just very, very proud of, of the record itself, everybody involved in it. And as far as the favorite song, I mean, I don't know. It's funny. You, you, yeah. you ask, you ask the general public and they'll, they're the same as me. It could be at any, any given song on any day is their favorite. So I think that's a good sign. They're all good songs to me. They're all like great. So good job. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Now you just signed, uh, I read you just signed with, uh, Germ Musica Promotion and Management. Very cool. Yes. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, so so last year, uh, Joe O'Brien at Rat Pack Records, we uh, you know, obviously had a plan on releasing the record and everything and you know, when COVID came along last year, it really just messed up so many things. Yeah. And the one thing that COVID allowed me to do was really focus on this and get this done. So if there's any silver lining to that mess It's that I got this album done. and But along with that, COVID interfered with, you know, the TSO tour, okay? Mm -hmm. So we were going to try to release El Terrain at the beginning of the TSO tour last year. Uh, once all of this started falling apart, then our schedule kind of changed up a little bit. Also, COVID, you know, it's it's affected the world. So oh, as, yeah. far as, as far as distribution... And getting physical product to, to anywhere, it just became that much more difficult. So we decided that we were going to basically, you know, keep everything close to home. You know, we released the record to Rap Pack. We, we advertised the hell out of it, you know, the best we could. Uh, I got hooked up with Amazons and, and iTunes and Deezer, all that kind of stuff. But we did not have a real, real promotion campaign in Europe set up for this because we didn't have any physical product there. Okay. So, so I've got a very good friend, uh, Peter Albers, who's a, a German. He, he writes for a magazine over there and he, you know, he got the album and he said, Jeff, you know, I, he absolutely loved it. He turned it on to some other people, same response. And of course the, the main comment was, you know, a, we just found out about this and then B, where do we get it? Yeah. So he knew he knows Birgit, who uh, who runs uh, Dramusica, and talked to me about doing a, pro a promotion campaign for the record. Even though the record's been out since January, uh, we had a long conversation about this, and, and she felt, as I felt, it was still worth promoting this record and getting it into people's ears, getting it into magazines, just making it that much more uh, public. So people could at least, if they if they want to order it as an import, you know, unfortunately, if you're overseas, that that involves you know a little bit more money. Yeah. But but it was available to get. But regardless, getting the band in front of people is going to set us up for the next record. So I figured th this is well worth the time and effort to do this. Uh, Birgit has a great reputation. I, I know she's going to do a good job for me. She's already dip, been doing a good job. Uh, so there's going to be some action happening pretty soon over in Europe as far as promotion and, and, and getting some, uh, some airplay on radio, etc. So all of this is, you know, it's kind of coming a little bit late in the game. But the bottom line is I want this record to be seen and heard or at least be made aware of to as many people as possible because I think the record is very strong and I think this is only going to benefit us when, when we do the second record now let's change uh, bands uh, let's talk Metal Church uh, just, sure. by, just by coincidence uh, today marks the fifth anniversary of uh, the album Eleven I don't know if you were aware of that uh, but you oh were, man you're right <laughs> Yeah, you, you were part of that So, uh, and also the return of Mike You know, yeah. What what yep. com what comes to mind with this record? Oh God! So I joined Metal Church. I believe it was in 2006. And you know, it's interesting. Metal Church and Sabotage they they, they kind of ran like like parallel careers. 
You know, they're both just amazing bands that, that for, for whatever reason, just had bad luck along the way, you know? Mm -hmm. And anyhow, when I joined Metal Church, I, I was just floored by how much great music there was in their catalog. Because I knew I knew the hit, you know, I knew Badlands, I knew Start the Fire and stuff like that. Oh yeah. But a lot of the older music, I was like, holy crap, this stuff is awesome. So, you know, it was, Kurt's a good friend. I love working with Kurt. The guys in the band were great. Anyhow, you know, the first version of, of Metal Church when I was in it, you know, with, with Roddy Monroe and uh, uh, Jay Reynolds on guitar, <laughs> that, that did well. And then things just started getting difficult. You know, it, it wasn't... It was the it was the band. It was marketing. It was just a lot of things were happening, and and Metal Church really kind of hit kind of a kind of a ditch there at one point. But you know, we came back with Generation Nothing, uh -huh. and and then things got you know things got shook up a little a little bit more, and the, the overwhelming response to to a vocalist another vocalist or a return vocalist to obviously come back in Metal Church was Mike Howe. Yeah. And the, the fans were looking for it. Kurt and Mike had, had started, you know, communicating again. They were working on music. And it was like, Mike, would you love, like to come back and sing for the band again? And Kurt was so excited about this, as we all were. You know, the fan base was super jacked about Mike being back in the band. He came back in the fold. He sounded amazing. Kurt wrote a very inspired record. Uh, musically, it's great. Lyrically, it's great. Uh, I think everybody really played well. I, I, I can say for myself personally, I think this is my, my, my highest moment, you know, as far as Metal Church. Uh, you know, the, the four records that I did with the band, this is by far my favorite, and I feel that I performed the best on this one too. So I, I'm very proud of that in, in both respects. But this was, uh, it was awesome released this record it did very well i think we hit number 56 on billboard uh, yeah. we had a couple of good tours we, we did we did some runs here in america we did some really good stuff in europe uh, we did the run with uh with megadeth the uh the little festival tour that Me megadeth had that's right yeah. in the states yeah. and and that was that was great but you know what it, it came to a, a point with me where as I'm not getting any younger, and obviously TSO is my TSO is my career. TSO is my bread and butter. I, I it is my main gig. I, I've been there from the very beginning of it, and it's very important for me. And I just kind of, you know, got, at a point in my life, I was weighing, you know, the value of staying in metal church and doing the touring and beating my body up yeah. and being away from home. You know, it was like things are happening at home too with my family. It's like I really didn't want to be away as much as I was previously. So I made a decision to step out of the band. And, you know, it was it was hard because I I love playing a metal church. I love playing that music. I think Kurt Vanderhoff has written some of the best metal music ever. And, you know, I was very thankful and very proud to have been able to, to be a part of that. But... But like I said, I just kind of hit a point in my life where I felt it's yeah. better that I step I, I step away now. Everybody's friends. There's no animosity. There's no problems. Uh, I need to step away now and take care of things on my end. And then obviously, you know, they brought in Stat Holland and, and did the did the next record, and you know, I've continued on. So everything wor it worked out for everybody. So, but but nonetheless, playing a metal church, you know, one of the classic metal bands of all time. Very very proud moment for me. I'm really happy that I was part of it. Yeah, great job on all those albums, uh, you know, Generation X, you know, uh, A Light in the Dark and all that. Uh, present, yeah, this present, yeah, this present wasteland. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, re that record was a perfect example of, of the frustration because I feel that's a really good record. Oh yeah. But 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 we just you know the promotion part of it and, and dealing with the label and just you know it was just Kurt had had so much of a problem throughout the years with that part of the business and we ran into it again with that record and it just became 
you know, hey guys, if we're not going to do this and enjoy what we're doing, what's the point, right? Yeah. Uh, so here again, that 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 record, I feel it's a really good record. It just it, it did didn't get its just due, but Metal Church is. <laughs> Trust me, there's thousands of other bands who have been in the same position, yeah. where you, you you write a great record and then all of a sudden somebody drops the ball and people don't hear it and you don't get to capitalize on it and, and work you know work it for the future and it's uh, it can be very frustrating. But yeah, so anyhow, but yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with with everything that I've done with them. But like I said, XI I think is the uh, the pinnacle for me with Metal Church. Uh, let's talk about uh, TSO. Uh, first of all, congrats on, on its success. I mean, uh, I saw it grow grow from from small to what it is now. I can't believe how how much it grew. You know, I mean, it's a huge <laughs> huge production. What I mean, I'm just like wow. You know, uh, you guys basically uh, you guys work all year, right? I mean, with the uh, with the tour, right? Something like that. Uh, can you talk about the process of a preparation for a tour? Well, to your point, yes, this this thing has become huge. Huge. Uh, we, you know, we, we did our first tour in 1999, and every tour has gotten bigger since. It's it's just amazing what has happened over oh. this period of time. You know, Paul O'Neill, Paul O'Neill created something that became a tradition for people. Right. You know, and when you say when you say that word, it's like. You got to sit and think about that. When when you've become a tradition, I think you've accomplished something. And and Paul really worked so hard at, at making TSO not only succeed, but succeed beyond our our expectations. You know, it's really amazing what we've done. The tour itself involves two different bands, uh -huh. East Coast and West Coast. Uh, each band does roughly. 55 shows in just under eight weeks uh, adding you know totaling up to roughly 110 shows between the two bands my my normal schedule when we do the winter tour is I play eight shows in five days every week wow. at the end of, at the end of this tour we between both bands we play to close to a million people every year wow. and and it has been it has been that high God for the past 10 or 12 years it's just incredible the fan base gets bigger every year and the production part of, of what TSO is is obviously you know a, a huge factor in the success of the tour the music is one thing which is great Paul's lyrics and stories which you know I feel they are the star of the show that, that's really what that's really what touched the hearts of people and and brought people into the room When, 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 when the general public figured out that the Trans Siberian Orchestra was a show that had a real meaning and it was a show for everybody, that's when this thing really snowballed and all of a sudden it became huge. But, but these tours, we've got 20 tractor trailers per tour, off touring buses wow. per, per tour. It is a huge production. Oh, wow. So when we get done with these tours, which is usually our last show date is December 30th. Um, there's obviously, you know, for, for somebody like myself, I certainly need a, need a break. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so January, I'm pretty much uh, catching up on some rest and everything. And there's always business to tie up, you know. As, as the management in the office and everybody takes a break, you know, by, by March, mid-March, building the next tour begins yeah so yeah, really the off the office the management the production team putting together the, the lighting design the stage design everything starts that early in the year and it just builds from there so you know for somebody like myself i i over the past couple of years unfortunately because of, of paul's passing uh -huh. uh, we're, we're still we're still uh kind of piecing some things together and 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 uh, picking up where he left off. But, you know, for the past couple of years, I have been, I've been basically home, you know, from January through through uh, middle, middle of October. But I've always got press to do. There's on occasion, there has been a little recording and a little work that way. But in previous years, I mean, we would be working on other music in the studio when Paul was here, you know, just putting together some of his ideas and working on stuff like that. So, 
so there's there's part of TSO that, that literally is a year-round job. But when it comes to somebody like myself, I'm pretty much on call for you know for when they need me in the studio and, and stuff like that. But uh, but we're hoping to get some things straightened out. You know, like I said, we, we lost Paul several years ago, and, and when you lose the the leader, yeah, you know, you lose your producer and your your you know the guy that had the vision and created this thing and made all the made all the decisions. You know, made every decision concerning everything with TSO. It certainly takes a while to get to get this stuff straightened out. So, so we're hoping to you know to do that. But it, but in the meantime, the winter tour is still strong as ever. It's still on track. Hopefully, we can get through this damn COVID mess, and you know, this year we can get back on the road. But you know, as far as the touring aspect of this, we we've, we've got this. You know, Paul Paul not only has you know, like myself and Chris Caffrey and, and Petrelli and, mm -hmm. and Johnny Middleton, we've, we've been here from the beginning of this. But we have a real great cast of musicians and singers that know what the job is. And, and also the management and the production team are fantastic. You know, we've, we've been doing this for a long time. So, so as, far as, the, as far as the live aspect, we're, we're in great shape. As far as uh, recording and stuff like that, there's, there's still some work to be done. Well, may he rest in peace, uh, Paul O'Neill. Uh, I'm so glad you guys kept it going. You know, uh, so so who, who 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 took over his uh, his place? I, I don't know how to address his position or producer, of course. But well, like I said, he was everything. Yeah. You know, he he, he was the songwriter. He was the lyricist. He was the producer. <laughs> he, he Paul okayed the the artwork. Paul okayed the t-shirts. Paul okayed the lighting. It was like everything everything that was TSO was Paul. He is, so, he is TSO, <laughs> right? Yes, yes. I mean, absolutely. Without Paul, there would there would not be a trans Siberian Orchestra. Uh, I, I have been so fortunate to be here from the beginning, you know, and a number of us have been a part of this, you know, helping build this and all this and that. But, but without Paul, without Paul's idea, without Paul's energy and, you know, his commitment to this thing, it never, ever would have succeeded. But... But to answer your question, I mean, that really is the question. You know, when, when we lost Paul, obviously TSO, you know, went, went, went to Paul's family, his wife and his daughter. Uh, but like I said, we have this whole team of people that have been here for this whole time. You know, obviously John Oliva uh, oh, yeah. always has been, has been one of Paul's writing partners for years, along with Al Petrelli. Uh, Derek Whelan, who has been with us for a long time, he has been the, uh, the, the the lead keyboardist and the musical director for the TSO East group. You know, there's a number of people that are that have been involved with Paul putting stuff together over the years. But still, now who is actually going to make the decision? On, yep. Who is going to make the decision on finishing the lyrics to this song? Who is going to make the decision on who is going to sing this song? Uh, who is going to make a decision on the production? You know, what do the drums sound like on the record? Do, you know, do you stick with the same thing? Do you try to do you try to you know change with the times? Do you uh, how, you know where who's got the answer? <laughs> right. And yeah. and there is there is no easy answer to this. But but like I said, I, I know. I mean, myself personally, I, I have confidence in. And, and the people that are involved here, and I think we'll be able to get this figured out. Now, I, I interviewed uh, Zach Stevens uh, during your the TSO uh, 2019 tour. Uh, he said you guys were had just finished the Green Bay uh, gig, and uh, there was a lot of snow and this and that. And uh, uh, he spoke about uh, the preparations a little bit, and you know the rehearsals. And he said that the, the West TSO and the East TSO play the exact exact same show and program I mean how do you guys go about that I mean I'm sure there's a set list but I mean everything he said everything is the same so wow. yeah so so in years past uh, the bands were I mean when, you, when the band goes on tour we are doing a specific show you know it's either it's either Christmas Eve and other stories you know Christmas Attic Lost Christmas Eve Ghost of Christmas Eve whatever the story is each band plays the basically the same set list. There may be a, there may be a change 
uh, between the two groups, it may, it, and more than likely, it's only one song. You know, it could be something to accommodate a, a certain singer on one side or the other. Uh, okay. But musically and set list wise, it really has always been basically the same. Now, the way that those songs were performed, uh, you know, each band, each band took its liberty to, to vamp on stuff and, and be creative with some of the songs and whatever. But for the most part, it was the same set list for, for both sides. So over the past several years, now that we've gotten into such a uh, the show has gotten so complex with video, with lighting, with the, with all the cues. I mean, you got lasers, you got fire, you got you got production from one end of the arena to the other. It's just mm -hmm. all of this now has really come down to the band need to be the production is in sync with itself. The band need to be in sync with the production and vice versa. It's it's so difficult now to put on a show that is this intense and this complicated without create, it, they both have to be pretty much exactly the same now. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Uh, in years past when, when when the video and the lighting wasn't so so extreme, you could get away with, with a few different things here and there. But now with the video being what it is, it really is critical that both bands, we play the songs the same tempo, they're all the same length, you know, all the video matches on each side, the lighting matches on each side. Uh, on occasion, there may be one song in the set, like I mentioned before, that, that might be different. But honestly, everything is is the same. Now, obviously, it's all different players. You know, Bloss Elias on the other side, he's, oh, yeah. he's the West drummer now. Great drummer. He doesn't play exactly everything that I do, and vice versa. So, so our, our individual personalities do come out a little bit on each side. But for the most part, it really is it really is a mirror image of, it, of each other. Now, how does, how does it feel playing in front of uh, thousands and thousands of people every night, man? Uh, it must be an experience. <laughs> do you get used to it, or do you still get nervous? Or I, I get nervous because I care. But, you know, honestly, it's, it's something you kind of get used to. Oh. And, and, to, and to be honest with you, I, I find myself being more comfortable in front of 10,000 people than I am in a small club in front of 10 people. <laughs> it's like when you when you play in front of an audience that's that big, it it becomes a little less personal. Yeah. You know, and I don't I hope nobody takes offense to that, but you know, I, I'll uh, an, an example is playing a festival. Uh -huh. You look out at eighty thousand people, it's just this one thing. You know, it's <laughs> it's this one mass that's jumping up and down and raising its fist, and you don't really see individual faces. You just see this this large mass of people the, and the carpet of people it, yeah yes yes it, it, there there is nothing like it in the world but i tell you for everybody in tso has a lot of pride in what they do and in the utmost respect for for paul and everybody that's been involved in building this trust me when i get on stage in an arena and it's full my job is to be as good as i can be every night every note every song and and we all approach it like that. Wow. We we've, we've got we've gotten comfortable with it, you know. And the TSO East Band has a great chemistry. We work very very well with the audience, as does the West. But I just enjoy being on stage, playing the music I'm playing, and also playing with the group of people that I'm playing with. Because you know, being in a band like this is something you dream about when you're when you're a kid. And and I I live it every night when I'm on tour, and not only that I get to play with with people like like Zach Stevens and Chris Caffrey and Joel Hoekstra on guitar, yeah, you, you know Russell Allen on vocals, Jeff Gonsoto. I mean you name it. The the, the talent that is involved in each of these groups really monsters. is monsters. They're all monsters. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And and when we when we've had the opportunity to do uh, you know like a one band tour when, when we did the Beethoven tour. Uh -huh. uh, we did a couple runs in Europe where there was just one group, you know, and it's mainly, you know, myself, Capri, Petrelli, and Middleton. We're, we're always the, the rhythm section when it comes to that. But then you get the, the best of the best. They come in and fill out the vocalist and fill out the rest of the cast. It really is something else to sit there <laughs> every night and hear these people come up and sing the way they sing 
every night on these tours. It really is just, it's just so awesome. But, um, but like I said, everybody, everybody gets on stage with a real purpose and, and hey, we love it. You know, it's, it's, I love playing in the rehearsals, you know, when there's nobody there. Really? It's, it's still a rush, it's still a rush being on that stage with all that production and I'm still playing with this amazing group of people. It's, it's, there's nothing like it. It's awesome. 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 Uh, let's talk about uh, sabotage. Uh I've been a fan since uh, since Mountain King, you know. I must sure. have, I must have worn out that cassette. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. Uh, congrats on your work, man. Uh, you know, Dead Winter Dead. You know, the poets, uh, Magellan. You know, uh, how did yeah. you land the How did you land the sabotage gig? Well, this is an interesting story. Uh, so I mentioned working with Zach Stevens and, and Matt Left in Boston. <laughs> The, 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 the story begins with Matt Left and Zach Stevens. They were both attending the Musical Institute Technology out in Hollywood. You know, Matt was going to GIT and, and Zach, I believe, was VIT, the vocal, you know, he was out there for vocal training and uh, education. That's where Matt and Zach first met. So when we began putting this band together in Boston, um, Matt and I flew Zach from, from California to Boston to, to put this band together. So the first night that I met Zach Stevens, you know, we, we picked him up at Logan Airport and, you know, I was like, well, let's go out and have a couple of beers and, you know, let's talk and get to know each other and hang out a little bit. So, yeah. so we said, let's go to this club. So we go to this club called The Channel and oddly enough, there's this band playing that night called Sabotage. Oh, wow. So, so the first night that I met Zach Stevens was the first time and the only time that I saw Sabotage while I wasn't in the band. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> very, very strange. It's awkward. So yeah. But but even 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 kinda of cooler is, is before all this happened, Zach when Zach lived in, in California, he was working uh, in hotel management. He was uh, working at the Holiday Inn or something like that. Uh, Sabotage actually stayed at the hotel that he was working at and met the guy. So, so he knew Sabotage back in like the late 80s. He knew the guy. The night that I met Zach and we saw Sabotage, Zach was actually talking with John Oliva and he was like, wow, that was cool, you know? And so, you know, fast forward the next, next several years, as we developed the band Wicked Witch in Boston, uh, you know, Zach was contacted about the idea of possibly singing the sabotage. And then when John decided to step down as vocalist, Zach auditioned and got the, got the gig. <laughs> so, so he left. He joined. Um, he joined the band in uh, what was it? Ninety two. I guess it was ninety three. Around there, yeah. Yeah, and uh, they did Edge of Thorn. So obviously, this was this was you know, this wasn't good news for me and Matt. We just lost a great singer, but right. <laughs> it, 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 at the same time, I was I was extremely happy for Zach. It's like, dude, you know, we we are trying to do this. I, I want somebody to succeed. Go for it. You know, go kick ass. So you know, when Edge of Thorns came out, I remember Matt and I we, we got the we got the album and listened to it and. And we loved it. And I remember Matt left saying, "Holy cow, this guitar player is amazing." Yeah. And he was speaking of speaking of Chris Oliva. Oh yeah. And so you know, so Zach was off. Zach was off and running. Good luck to him. Uh, Matt and I kind of kind of hit a wall. We we couldn't find another singer. Uh, I had spent ten years in Boston trying to trying to make something happen and. You know, I figured, God, it's at this point in my life, but it's probably time for me to go home and rethink, rethink what I'm doing. So I moved back to New York in in, uh, in 1993, and unfortunately, in the fall of '93, Chris Oliva was was killed in a car accident, mm -hmm. and 
I heard of this, and you know, I waited a few months, and it was it was early 1994, and I called Zach just to see how he was doing, and you know, would he be interested in in maybe revisiting Wicked Witch, or re- revisiting that project, uh-huh. and possibly doing something with it, or you know. So I call up Zach, and he said that uh, that Paul and John had had plans on keeping Sabotage going. Uh, they were going to bring Alex Skolnick in to do lead guitar on the next record, and the guys were impressed with with my drumming on our Wicked Witch demo, and uh, and had seen some photos, and and on Zach's word, he said they want to hire you for the for the gig. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> and and I was. Uh, I was in my apartment here in Horseheads, New York, thinking this is the last place I'm ever going to get this phone call. And uh, yeah, sure as hell, I'm, I'm, I'm down in Florida the next month. I meet everybody. Uh, they had basically finished recording Handful of Rain. John, John Oliva had done the drumming on the record. But but I went down and met everybody. We did a photo shoot. You know, one thing led to another. It was like, Jeff, go home and just learn everything. And, and you know, we, we hit a couple, we hit a couple bumps in the road there because, because the band had changed so much. Huh. You know, Zach was now the lead singer. There was a new drummer. There was a new guitar player. Uh-huh. Uh, it was just, I mean, I was so happy that I got this opportunity, and at the same time, I felt so bad for these guys. You know, it's like, yeah, it was it was tough. It was really tough. And but anyhow, things worked out. We we did the handful of rain tour here in the states. Um, in that tour, I was hired as as the full time drummer. I was the new member of Sabotage. Awesome. And we went to Japan. We did Japan Live '94. And, oh, yeah. and then from there, then from there, dead, winter, dead. And we brought El Charlie into the band. We brought Chris Caffrey back back into the band. So now we have this lineup, and we did Dead Winter Dead, and of course Christmas Eve Sarajevo was on there, which was the which was really the the, the start for TSO. TSO, yeah. But but at the same time, Dead Winter Dead was very successful in Europe, and and that band. I don't know if you were ever able to see that lineup with with myself, Zach. Chris Caffrey, John Oliva, Petrelli, and Johnny Middleton. That band kicked ass. I mean, we were. Oh yeah. We we had it going on there. Once once we got on the roll, we were we were doing really well. So we had a we had several years, you know, promoting uh, Dead Winter Dead. We did Wake Magellan. Uh, then obviously some other things happened in the band. Zach stepped out. Al went to uh, Al joined Megadeth there for a couple of years and. And alongside of that, TSO was becoming much more popular and much more important. So, you know, things got a little uh, things got a little off track there as far as sabotage was concerned. But, but nonetheless, I I, I was just so <laughs> I was just so thrilled that I got the chance to join this band. And you know, as I said with Metal Church, when I joined Sabotage and started learning all this material, I couldn't believe how how fantastic this music was. Oh yeah. I, I I knew Gutter Ballet, I knew Hall of the Mountain King, I knew uh, I knew Strange Wings, but yeah. man, you get into that catalog, yeah. like, oh my god, these albums are great, and you know, I, it was just a thrill. Uh, my style fit the band, um, 
personality-wise, it was great to be working with Zach again. You know, we, we were really good friends. And, and then Johnny and, and Chris Caffrey, the whole group just really, really gelled. So it's, uh, it's been amazing, you know, and, and here yeah. we are, here we are 2021. We've not played a show since 2002. And it's amazing that the fan base still wants to hear from this band. It just oh, yeah. blows my mind, but it's, it's so cool. Well, I mean, you can say Sabotage still lives. You know, it's, it's uh, Middleton, yourself. Uh, Caffrey, you know, Oliva, yeah. Oliva's still there, uh, Petrelli, so in a way you can say TSO is Sabotage, right? Well, interestingly enough, all six of us work together in TSO, you know, we, yeah. we, we see each other every year, we talk throughout the year, it's, you know, TSO has obviously become the, you know, the, the, the main thing in our lives as far as our career musically and everything, and financially, I mean, you can't argue with what, what TSO has has become and, and what you know how we've all benefited from this it's it's just really been a life-changing you know experience being yeah. being a part of this but uh but you know along with that i mean you listen to gutter ballet in streets and even dead winter dead and wake of magellan you can you can hear you can hear tso the, yeah you hear the seeds of tso in that music so mm -hmm. it's you know paul was thinking of doing tso for a long time before it ever even happened so, as TSO developed, and it's like, you know, TSO has its own sound, and sure there is, you can hear the similarities with Sabotage, but it also, you know, as the years went by, it became very apparent that songs like Chance, uh -huh. this is this is a perfect TSO song. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, you know, we've performed some of, these, some of these songs on stage with the full TSO ensemble, and they just sound amazing. Oh, yeah. You know, Ch Chance, uh, Handful of Rain, Got gutter ballet. This is the time. You know, there's a handful of songs from those TSO records that that just really, you know, with with when you've got all the orchestration and all the vocals to, to recreate these songs, yeah. it just sounds amazing. So it's oh, yeah. that that's been that's been very very cool. Now here's a couple of fan questions. Um, Chris is asking, ask him if there is any truth to a sabotage returning this year. Well. <laughs> you know, like I said, right? after all, after all these years, fans are still yeah. anxious to hear something from from Sabotage. And whenever there is a nugget that's thrown out there, people get excited about it. So the reality is, I really don't know. Okay. You know, I, I I know that I know the talk of you know. Listen, the reality is, John is always writing. Uh -huh. John is. John is writing with with Petrelli. Uh, they've been working on TSO stuff, some stuff that hasn't been finished, some new stuff. But John is always writing, whether it's for himself or whether it's for TSO, or maybe he's writing something that, you know, he says, God, this would be a great sabotage song. You know, I have not heard any new material. Yeah. Uh, I know the focus has really been on, on trans Siberian Orchestra and making sure that this thing, you know, still still is able to, to move forward of course, and, and yeah. get and get bigger. But the million dollar question, you know, uh -huh. what, are we gonna do something? The answer is I honestly do not know. Okay. Would I love to would I love to do something? Of course I would. Awesome. You know, I mean I, I think that's just a, that's just a very honest answer to to the question. Um, yeah. But there's but there's a lot more involved in it than just doing that. So so this is something that, that we have to, to keep in mind too when we when we ask these questions because yeah. the, there's a lot of people involved. You know, we're still dealing with with the loss of Paul, uh, and these things do take time to sort out. So, hey, if something happens, yeah. would would that be one hell of a story? Oh man! I, I mean, sabotage sabotage has been through so much over the years, yeah. and and oddly enough. Me coming into the band, you know, I don't know if I would have come into the band had it not been for for Chris's accident. Uh -huh. You know, I don't I don't know how any of this would have would have worked out. But True. but when I joined, like I said before, the band the band had every right at that point to say we're done, uh -huh. and they stuck it out. And then Dead Winter Dead happened, and then Michael and Jalen, and then, you know, and then all this other stuff happened. So so Paul and John, to their credit really you know stuck their necks out 
and committed to Sabotage as a band and, and kept it alive. So that is it's pretty remarkable. They, they had every reason to shut that band down a dozen times. Yeah. And, and they didn't. So here again, I feel very, very proud of, <laughs> of what we've done in the past because obviously it made such an impression on fans. Oh, yeah, you know, all, ar- all around the world, the fans every year still want to see Sabotage. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's very, very cool. I'm very, very proud of that, and I know, I know everybody else is proud of that, too. So there you go, to all the fans asking, uh, you know, there's an answer right there from the drummer, Jeff himself. There you go. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, here's Got another it. question uh, from Zachary. Uh, he says, uh, what's the most complicated song he's ever played? And uh, are there any bands he would like to have sat in and done a song with? Oh, man. <laughs> <All right>. Wow. <laughs> the most complicated? Um, God, that's, that's a tough question. It is, yeah. That's a tough question. You know, I'm thinking of a song like Takata with TSO because there's there's so many different parts to it. Okay. Uh, uh, it, 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 changes, it changes a lot. It has a lot of dynamics to it. Uh, there are certainly some metal church stuff that really put me to the test, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, a ton of bricks. Yeah. That, oh, yeah. that song, yeah, that, that was a workout there. Um, oh, man. That, that's a hard one to that's a hard one to answer you know I mean, I'll tell you too it is it isn't even like this it isn't even like the the most complicated songs are the hardest you know some of the ballads I mean like playing playing the song believe uh-huh. and play playing it correctly playing it in the pocket and not overplaying it that is <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's, that's not easy a lot of this TSO stuff that, that we do uh, you know, especially on the on the Christmas albums. You know, Angel Came Down and Ornament, some of these really slow, uh, dynamic, emotional ballads. For me, as a drummer, you really have to hold back. Yeah. And and honestly, this was this was a style of drumming that I had to really work on because with Paul, his lyrics and the story re- really was front and center, and yeah. the idea was was to not ever get in the way of that. And he always loved the songs and the music to breathe. And my job in a lot of those songs was really just to lay down the backbeat, uh, maybe throw some dynamics in here and there, but really just to hold the thing back. And and this was honestly, this was honestly a challenge for for all the musicians involved when we started doing this stuff live because. When you get on a stage in front of all that many people, of course you have adrenaline. You know you're excited. The hardest thing is to not rush these songs. And, you know, trust me, it took us a lot of time in the rehearsal room going back and forth over tempos and things like that to really get this stuff right. But, uh, but yeah, I'll tell you what. I mean, there's, there's, I, I've been so fortunate to play some of the coolest music over all these years. Yeah. <laughs> and, and some of it has just been downright fun to play. Some has been a challenge and some has been just rewarding to be able to do it properly. And, and you know, it's very cool. I, I, I've just been very fortunate to be able to play in these bands where there's that much variety and that much dynamic in the music. It's it's really made that my job that much more fun. Awesome. So what's next for uh, Jeff Plate? Uh, what are you brewing? What's what's going on uh, in the future here? So, so what I am doing now is, like I mentioned, I'm starting to work on the next El Terrain record. Um... My guitarist, Tommy Cook, has been doing a solo record, so I've been helping him with that, and we're, we're just about done with that. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the process for the next El Terrain record has begun, and and honestly, my, you know, I was so, once I got involved in really putting that last record together, I absolutely loved the process, no. and I can't wait to get back in and, and start working on the next one. We've got some really, really strong ideas. I, I know Mother's Day has really set quite a standard, and I think we've got the material to measure up to that. So I'm excited to get that, to get working on that and get that recorded. Um, I also teach. That's I right. teach online. That's right. Yeah. If, uh, if anybody out there is interested, just, just hit me up. And, uh, you know, it's really, it's one of those things about COVID that really sucked because I, I had... 
you know, I had a dozen students here just locally, and, and everybody would come to my house. We would we would do lessons in my studio, and and that was great. And then all of a sudden, COVID came along, and transitioning over to doing everything online was was definitely a little weird at first. Huh. But I, I got it figured out. I got used to it. I, I think I have a really good system, and now I have. You know, I got students kind of all over the place, and it's, nice. it's pretty cool. So, so I'm continuing to do that. I really, I really love teaching. I love teaching young young kids. It's it's just so so rewarding. It's so fun. Cool. Um, but along with that, you know, I, I just kind of I live on a farm. I have 85 acres that I uh, that I maintain, and I'm I'm always doing something out out the outside throughout the year. So I'm always busy. But uh, you know, here again. Main thing is, we're just hoping that everybody, we're hoping that the world can get back on track. We, we'll try to get this COVID thing behind us, try to get back to normal. Uh, hopefully TSL can get back on the road this year. And uh, if we can get that back on track, maybe some other things will fall in place too. So so every, everything looks good. I, I think uh, there's some promising stuff ahead, but uh, yeah, in the meantime, I stay busy and stay hopeful. Awesome, Jeff. Uh, thank you for making time and uh, hope to see you on the road soon, man. You got it, James. What an honor. What an honor it is for me to speak to all these uh, rock stars and metal stars and death metal stars. And it's an honor for me to bring to you guys via the internet all these awesome uh, conversations with these uh, rock stars, man. So I hope you guys uh, are enjoying this and thank you for your support, man. Uh, try to share share our, our episodes and all that if you guys really like what you hear, you know. Thank you for joining our YouTube page, That Metal Interview, of course, ring the bell. And uh, thank you for sharing and sharing and sharing. And thank you for liking us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just look us up, That Metal Interview. And also, uh, don't forget about our radio show, jrocksmetalzone.com. And let's keep rocking and supporting Mr. Jeff Plate. Uh, look him up on his socials. And we hope Sabotage, we hope Sabotage keeps rocking and rolling. For us metalheads, and of course, some more TSO and some more Alta Rain. Thank you, Jeff. We appreciate your time, and we really, truly feel honored to speak to such a legend on the drums. Thank you a million times. And don't forget to keep it metal. Metal Interview.